What's up guys? Today we're going to be talking about Gen 2 again, but instead of going over some super specific technical details of Gen 2, we're actually going to be zooming out a bit and talking about Gen 2 more as a concept, what it is, what you can do with it, and what kind of things you should know about it before trying to install it on your system. Now, one of the big things that sets Gen 2 apart from other distros is the fact that it isn't even really a distro in the traditional sense. It's more of a meta distro, and here is the reason for that. So with almost every other Linux distro, once somebody tells you what they're using, that they're using it, you can pretty safely infer a lot of additional information about the system and be right 99% of the time. For example, if somebody tells you that they are running Linux Mint, you pretty much know their software stack right away. You know that they're gonna be using System D as the init system, Xorg as the display server, and then built on top of that is gonna be some kind of desktop environment, most likely XFCE or Cinnamon. And that user is probably also using Linux Mint as a desktop OS instead of a server or an embedded device, and they probably even used Windows before switching to Linux Mint because it's typically the just works distro that's more suited for people coming from Windows. Now, of course, there's going to be exceptions to this. You know, not every single Linux Mint user uh, is going to be a previous Windows user. And since Mint is based off of Debian, I guess you could conceivably use it as a web server. Uh, you would just want to uninstall all of the additional stuff that comes with Mint that makes it a desktop OS. But you get the idea. Mint, Manjaro, Peppermint OS, these are all, they all have very specific purposes. They're going to be desktop Linux operating systems. But Gen2, on the other hand, it can be used for just about anything. In fact, the biggest thing that makes Gen2 more than just a desktop OS is the variety of architectures that it supports. So most distros, they're only going to be AMD64. Uh, some of them might be x86 as well. But Gen2 supports ARM, RISC-V, x86, and much more. But even within the most common uh, AMD 64 architectures, there's still going to be a lot more customizations that you can do uh, even beyond a distro like Arch Linux. So with Gen 2, you get choices with your low level software, things like your init system, your kernel and your core utilities. Uh, like I said earlier, with other distros, you already know what those things are going to be because the maintainers chose them for you. And it's actually pretty difficult to do something different on a lot of these other distros. Uh, so you know that they're going to be using systemd as their init system, for example. You know that they're using a stock kernel and the GNU core utils. But with Gen2, you could use S6 init or OpenRC. Uh, you can customize your kernel to include or exclude whatever modules and drivers you want. You could use BusyBox instead of GNU, and you could compile things with Clang instead of GCC. Now, part of the reason that we are able to do this is thanks to Gentoo's package manager Portage, which is a little bit different than other package managers because it builds packages on your system according to the specifications that you've defined for them. Not only are Gentoo systems configured in unique ways, but all of the packages on those systems get compiled in unique ways as well through setting use flags. So these use flags, they pretty much explain to Portage the type of functionality that you want built into your packages. And you can set them on a system wide basis to apply to all packages, or you can do it on a per package basis. Now compare this to virtually any other distro where the packages are going to be compiled by the maintainers and you just download them and install the binaries. Those packages are going to be compiled to work with as many setups as possible. So let's say, for example, you install Manjaro, but you don't plan on using Bluetooth on Manjaro. Well, Bluetooth support is still going to be compiled into your kernel. Um, all of your packages are going to have Bluetooth support and installing one of them might even bring in Blue Z as a dependency uh, if it isn't already installed on your system by default. And some people actually consider Bluetooth to be a security risk because um, you know it's an additional feature that's just sitting there and it is Bluetooth of all things, not very secure to begin with. 
Uh, so just w waiting to be exploited if you have it on your system and you're not actually going to be using it as an end user, you're not going to get any of the benefits that Bluetooth might be able to give you. The same even applies to desktop environments. So it's gonna be really rare that someone is gonna use KDE, GNOME, and XFCE all on one desktop. But if you're installing generic binary, generic binary packages, they're almost always gonna be compiled to support all of those desktop environments because it's just easier for the maintainers of that distro to have all of the packages coming from one repo regardless of the end user setups. Um, now you're even able to compile things specifically for your architecture. So say if you're using an Intel CPU with, and you're using the Haswell series, there might be a certain way to compile these packages so that they are optimized for that specific CPU, uh, but not for other ones. And the optimizations might even cause the packages to not even work on other CPUs, but that's fine if you aren't using those. So you might as well get the slight performance boost uh, or save some space on your system. Again, on binary distros, you aren't going to get this because the packages are all going to be compiled in an extremely generic way. So now you have a pretty good high level understanding of what Gentoo is, but before you download a stage three tarball and get started with installing it, there are a few specific things that you should know first. So all of the customizations that I mentioned earlier, they do have a drawback, which is that you have to compile things if you want them built in a unique way. So compiling packages from source, that's gonna take a lot longer than just installing a binary, especially if it's a really big packages with a lot of dependencies. Like let's say you wake up one morning and decide you want to emerge Firefox. Well, you probably shouldn't do that in the morning or the afternoon. You should wait until you're about to go to bed to install Firefox because it isn't unusual for Firefox, Rust, and you know any other dependencies to take several hours to install, even with setting your make ops to eight. So you should take a look at the dependency tree of a package before you emerge it so that you can decide, okay, do I want to do this now or do I want to wait until I'll be away from the computer for a while? That way you can manage your time more effectively. Um, next, is that it's good to have a reason to install Gen2 beyond just saying you did. Now, this really isn't a requirement considering that a lot of people install DIY distros like Arch for bragging rights, but Gen2 is a much bigger time sink than Arch, so you're probably going to want more out of it than just bragging rights. Gen2, with its kernel options and its use flags, it lets you take customizations to a much higher level. And really, Gen2 is pretty much the Linux endgame. So you need to know about use flags and kernel modules to really take advantage of them. So you should do your research, uh, learn what these flags and kernel options do so that you can actually benefit from them when you're installing Gen2. And last but definitely not least is that you should know the proper way to rescue a broken Linux system. So if you're going to install Gentoo, um, one of the common problems, and not even just with Gentoo, like with pretty much any hobbyist distro, is that they break. And it's usually through your own fault, but sometimes they will break in unexpected ways. Now, if you're coming from an easy distro, or especially if you're coming from Windows, the way that you might fix a broken system is to just reinstall it. And this usually isn't that big a deal, especially if your data is backed up. You could just boot from a live USB, reinstall the distro, reinstall any add-on packages if you had any to begin with, uh, and then copy your data back and you're back up and running in 30 minutes or less. But on Gen 2, reinstalling your system means recompiling your system. And to get from a live CD to a Gen2 desktop with just a simple window manager and not even a larger desktop environment, you're still going to be looking at a couple of hours to get that. And you know, you, if you need to install thousands of packages or something like that, then it's going to take a day or more guaranteed unless you have dozens of threads to throw at your compiler. So if you do run into a kernel panic or a broken grub config, it's much better to actually fix that uh, really on any Linux distro, I would say that it's going to be better to fix it than to redeploy it. But even from a time management perspective, fixing is gonna be much better than redeploying on Gentoo. 
So there you go, a high level overview of Gen 2 and some things to keep in mind before installing it. I hope that you guys found this video useful. Be sure to share it with anyone that you know is thinking about installing Gen 2. It might even save them some time and enjoy the rest of your day.